there is one more of these many prints available, if someone didn't send it, please remember to do it from now. All right, we're dealing here with structure and bonding. We're going to start all the way back with atomic structure, talk just a little bit about that, move up to how we do bonding, um, talk about hybridization, um, and then move into carbon compounds, how we represent them, etc. This is an atom. In the 1950s, this is where the atoms were drawn and perceived. Um, probably seen something like this on Jimmy Neutron or Big Bang or whatever. Um, this really isn't how atoms are. Uh, typically in the old uh, version, we had a nice healthy nucleus in the middle and little electrons that orbits around it. Um, quantum mechanics tells us that this is very, very different. This is a representation of the carbon atom. Organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon. So we're going to talk a lot about carbon and carbon compounds. The differences are the nucleus is really teeny, teeny, tiny. It's in the middle. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And electrons don't really reside in orbits. They reside within regions of space. Um, these are quantized by the uh, inherent energy of the particular electron. For carbon, we're going to have two of these levels, an inner level and an outer level. Uh, carbon has an atomic number of six here. It's in the second period of the periodic table. Um, so it has six electrons. Typically, it will have six neutrons and six electrons if it is neutral. The um, Electrons in carbon, we can divide up into two general categories. Core electrons are in, they're close to the nucleus. They're very important, of course, but we don't care about them because they don't do anything. Um, the outer shell of electrons are referred to as valence electrons, and these are the guys that are involved in bonding. Now, atoms in general are very, very small. If you could find a real copper penny, and of course this isn't, but if it was copper, it would contain roughly 28 sextillion copper atoms, just in one penny. Particles that make it up are very, very small. Um, proton has a mass of about 10 to the minus 24 grams. Neutron, very, very similar. And an electron is much, much less, at about 10 to the minus 28 grams. Um, what this means is that for, say, carbon and all uh, elements, actually, um, virtually all the mass is collected in the tiny, tiny little nucleus in the middle. And there's very little mass associated with the electrons. Now, when I drew this, and I make all my own slides, by the way, um, when I drew this slide, I made the nucleus here one pixel, which is as small as I could get it. But even that's an exaggeration. Just to give you an idea, this is Wrigley Field. And this is a golf ball. If this golf ball was sitting in the middle of the infield, And all of Wrigley Field and the rooftop bleachers, etc., cetera, um, were considered the electron cloud. This would be to scale. Nucleus is so tiny, the golf ball on the infield, and all the rest of this is simply our electron cloud. So basically, atoms are totally empty. We have a teeny tiny nucleus with all the mass and a very large electron cloud. Some very, very basic definitions. <clears throat> of element, of course, we all know, um, contains only one type of atom. 
These atoms are represented on the periodic table by symbols, and we organize these in the periodic table. Now, a typical periodic table looks something like this. We have average atomic mass down here, atomic number, and a symbol. Carbon, like I said, is in the second period, period going down. It is in root 4, 4A, four um, and the average atomic mass is 12.01. Uh, remember, the average atomic mass takes into account all of the isotopes of carbon. Um, for carbon, we have almost all of carbon 12, have a tiny bit of carbon 13, and a trace of carbon 14. Carbon-13 will become important to you in Chemistry 235 because there is a spectroscopy, carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy, that focuses on that particular isotope. Now, organic chemistry really is the chemistry of carbon. Um, all of our compounds will have carbon in them, and they'll have some of these other guys. The standing joke is that this is the periodic table, but this is the periodic table according to organic chemists. We will make compounds with carbon, hydrogen, um, the halogens, this little handful of elements. Now, in reality, carbon also forms bonds with lots of these others, but these are the major players. So we're going to focus on this small group of elements for most of the compounds that we do. Any questions? All right, let's return to carbon. And let's talk a little bit about its electron configuration. We said that we have electrons in two shells, a core electron and the valence electron. Um, this is in a cloud. They're both clouds. Um, Core electrons are not involved in bonding, but uh, the valence electrons are. Now, the distribution of electrons between the different energy levels uh, depends upon the placement in the periodic table. Let's return to our periodic table. The quantum level of the electrons is given by the period here, 1 through 7. And every quantum level we can put a certain number of electrons in, and that's 2n squared, where n is the period number. That means in the first period, we can put a maximum of two electrons. Second period, where carbon lives, we can put a total of eight. Down here, we can put 18, etc. Now, within each of these um, quantum levels, the electrons actually reside in orbitals. The lowest energy orbital is an S orbital. It's spherical. Uh, it will be associated with the first two groups of the periodic table. Um, the orbitals are given, orbitals and suborbitals, are given initials <coughs> S, P, D, and F. And again, each orbital that we'll see can hold a maximum of two electrons. Higher energy than the S are the P orbitals. Now for carbon, we're going to be interested in S's and P's. Um, the P orbitals, you'll note, are lobes. And the lobes are oriented along the x, y, z axis. Again, the S orbital is spherical. When we get further down on the periodic table, we get to D and F orbitals. Now, these are really cute, okay? But we don't really have to worry too much about these. The geometry here is um, very, very interesting. I really like these guys. Um, remember, an orbital is simply the solution to a quantum um, quantum mechanics problem, where you are trying to define the region of space where a particular electron would reside. When we say we have p orbitals that look like this, what this means is that there's 
can be a maximum of two electrons in each, and that, say, 90% of the time, they will be located within these various lobes. So that's what our orbital definition is. Now this is all linked to the periodic table this way. Our first period, we said it could hold a maximum of two electrons. And so these are going to both go into an S orbital, that's the lowest energy. We'll put one electron in for hydrogen, two electrons in for helium. And that's all we can do in our first period. The second period, where carbon lives, first two electrons are going to go here, groups one and two, and they're going to go into the second quantum level, so it's a two, and we're going to fill up the lowest energy first, so they go into the 2s. That's for lithium and beryllium. <clears throat> Get over here for group three. We're going to put the next six electrons into these p orbitals. Again, each one can hold two electrons for a total of six. Carbon is in group four. That means it has one, two, three, four valence electrons. In our third period, we can hold 18. First two, again, will go into the um, 3s. Now, we would expect to start putting orbital or electrons into the 3ds, but that doesn't work. The next electrons go over here into the 3ps. We don't fill up the 3ds because it turns out that the 4s is lower energy than the 3d. So when we fill up out here, the next electrons go down here. Then we start putting electrons in the 3d orbitals. And finally, we would fill up the 4ps. And this all continues down as we get into more complex orientations. Any questions? Everything you ever wanted to know about electron configuration here, right? All right. As we're putting these electrons in, there is a way that they go in. An electron can be described by a bunch of quantum numbers, and one of them is referred to as spin. Now, it's not really spinning. Okay, let's understand that. It's not really spinning. But it has this property that's called spin. This property that it's called spin actually generates a local magnetic field associated with that electron. Let's listen to the young lady here. Oh, come on. You know, sometimes PowerPoint does this to me just to be mean. Well, okay, it's not going to play. I'm sorry, uh, but it's a little movie. But what the person would say, if it would work, um, is that as these electrons spin, they generate a local <coughs> magnetic field we wind up with one possible orientation like this, where we'll call it north is up, and another one where north would be down. This means we can assign electron spin, and we tend to represent that as little arrows up and down. Now, we really don't know which one's up and which one's down, but this is important because as we're filling orbitals, there's something called Hund's rule. And it simply says that electrons must go in one at a time. And as you fill an orbital, they must have opposite spins. OK, so if we're dealing with hydrogen, we have well, right here in our first group, our first period, we can put in one electron. We can show it like this. Helium, again, our first period, way over here in group eight. 
<coughs> we still have only the one orbital, and we would put in two electrons, one with a spin up, and one with spin down. We also abbreviate it this way, because we get tired of drawing little arrows. Um, this is referred to as 1s superscript 1, 1s superscript 2. And basically, you go through electron configuration, assigning them like this, putting them in with the same spin. After a suborbital is filled, then you start to pair them up. So let's use carbon as an example. Very quickly, go ahead and draw for me the electron configuration for carbon. Remember, carbon is here in our second period in our fourth group. We'll have a total of 12, um, a, to a total mass of 12. Uh, six of those will be neutrons, six protons, and six electrons. All right, because we're in our second group, our second period, I mean. <coughs> Our first period is going to be filled. These are the 1s electrons. Then we're going to put the next set of electrons into the 2s, and then move them into the 2p's. So the way we would show this is something like this. We're going to fill up our 1s. We have two electrons, and they have opposite spin. For our second period, our 2s is going to be filled. We have two electrons, and again, they have opposite spin. For our 2p, we have three orbitals, p, x, y, and z. Remember, we're going to put electrons in, one at a time, all with the same spin. After we get that filled, then we start to pair them with opposite spins. So, for carbon, we have two electrons, again the same spin, in two of our p orbitals. So our total configuration looks like this. And again, if we were to write this, we would say this is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. When you see this, you are expected to understand that these are separate p orbitals, again, with the same spin. Any questions? Yeah? You could also write it with like the bracket from the, you know what I'm saying? Ah, this is good enough. Right. I know there are lots of conventions how to do that from general chemistry. Um, let's just keep it simple. Now, if any of this if any of the stuff that we're going to talk about in this chapter or chapter two doesn't work for you, um, if you have any questions, uh, if your background is that you took general chemistry a long time ago and whatever, this is chemistryonline.com. This is my website. Um, this is the partition for the intro chemistry. So this is used for intro in general. And well, there's lots of stuff there if you want to redo intro chem, you can. But the thing that if you have a specific question that might be useful is this thing called microtutorials. Microtutorials are designed to be relatively painless. Um, they are little movies, again, with slides and audio. Uh, they're about oh, five to 10 minutes long at max. And they just deal with a very specific subject. So if you're weak on electron configuration, I think elements and isotopes probably covers it. And there's lots and lots of other stuff there, too. We're going to do Lewis dots now. So if you're um, shy on Lewis dots, that's a fine place to, to review this stuff. Just here, again, chemistryonline.com. Um, there's also an organic partition. 
back. <clears throat> and um, there will be content appearing in the organic partition. I'm working on a set of micro tutorials to accompany organic. All right, so let's go ahead and take what we know about carbon and its valence electrons, and let's review the concept of the Lewis dot structures. Now, this is a very, very old concept. Um, it was developed by Lewis long before anyone knew anything about the quantum mechanics of bonding. So it's really a fairly um, interesting thing. Carbon, it was known, formed four bonds, and it's in the fourth period. Um, Lewis kind of figured out that that means it must have four valence electrons. Um, Lewis structures are good because they help us uh, develop an appreciation for bonding. If you forgot, the way you do it is you start off with a chemical symbol. So for carbon, that's a C. We have four valence electrons. Lewis said we're going to put four dots around our symbol, one to represent each electron. Once we add more than four, we will pair them up. But the four go in singly first. So the Lewis structure for carbon very simply looks like this. Um, once again, once we get more than four, we start to pair them. Let's just do that with fluorine. I'll go ahead and do that. Fluorine is in the second period. It is in the seventh group. All right, we have seven valence electrons. We would put these in one at a time, and then we would pair them until they're all done. Um, there is one unpaired electron. Remember the octet rule. The octet rule applies to Lewis structures, basically saying that once we have filled up um, our outer shell here with eight valence electrons, that we reach extraordinary stability. And so as you're building bonds, you are trying to make an octet of electrons around each atom. Can't always do that, but that's what you're shooting for. Let's go ahead and use this and show how we make a simple covalent bond. And we show it with a Lewis structure. This is chlorine. Chlorine is in our uh, third period here, it's in the seventh group, so it has seven valence electrons, shown just like this. We all know that chlorine exists as a diatomic Cl2. In order to show this bond in a Lewis structure, you would simply bring in your other chlorine and allow them to pair up like this. As we're doing our octet rule, Remember, we count the shared electrons twice, so it is true sharing. And we have eight electrons around this chlorine and eight electrons around this one. This bond that we form between the two chlorines is a covalent bond. Once again, that means we are sharing electrons. Virtually all the bonding that we're going to do in organic is going to be covalent. Instead of drawing lots of little dots, Quite often, in fact, usually, we'll replace a bonding pair just as a dash. Again, you are expected to understand that whenever you see a dash connecting atomic symbols, um, this represents two electrons in a covalent bond. Now let's just build a couple simple covalent molecules just for practice. Let's start off with ammonia. Here's your periodic table. Step one, you want to find the uh, atoms, put the valence electrons around them. 
nitrogen is going to be our central atom, and we're going to try to form an octet around our nitrogen. Um, hydrogen is in our first period, so it can only accommodate two electrons, so we want two electrons around each hydrogen. So nitrogen is here in group 5. We have five valence electrons. Hydrogen is group 1. We have one valence electron. We need two electrons in a covalent bond. All we have to do is snuggle these guys up. <clears throat> when we do that, we can put eight valence electrons around our nitrogen, and of course two electrons around each of the hydrogens. If we were to draw this using lines, we would represent it this way. And again, the common nomenclature, <clears throat> this is referred to as a single bond or a single covalent bond. Any questions? All right. Let's do something a little more interesting. How about nitrogen, N2? Nitrogen still lives in the fifth group. So it has five valence electrons. Now we're still shooting to give every nitrogen um, an octet of electrons. We have two electrons here that we've drawn between the two nitrogens. Obviously we can use those to form a covalent bond. But if we did it just like this, that would give us one, two, three, four, five, six electrons around each nitrogen. That's not eight are good. So what we're going to do is instead of forming a single bond, we're going to move electrons in and form a multiple bond. Let's start off by taking a couple of these, move them between the nitrogens. Let's take these guys up here, move them between the nitrogens. Now if you scooch them together, we have eight electrons around this nitrogen and eight electrons around this nitrogen. They both have an octet, and what we have formed is a nitrogen nitrogen triple bond. We show this as three covalent bonds, each one representing two electrons, and again, it's a triple bond. We'll see that carbon will form single, double, and triple bonds in its compounds. Any questions? <clears throat> Let's do one more then. Carbon monoxide. <clears throat> carbon is group four, oxygen is group six. We start off with four electrons around our carbon and six electrons around our oxygen. Now once again we want to give everybody an octet. Um, we can make one bond here this way, but we're obviously going to have to split these electrons up and make multiple bonds if we're going to make this work. So let's take and rearrange these a little bit. I move one electron from here up there, move the other one up too. Um, this gives us two, four, six, seven electrons on the oxygen. Let's move this one down, this one over. 
And now we're left with these two unpaired electrons that just looks ugly. So let's go ahead and pair them up. Now when we scoot it all together, we can see we have eight electrons on our carbon, eight electrons on the oxygen, and once again we have made a triple bond. A carbon monoxide is actually oh, a real exception to what we'll do with bonding um, in organic chemistry. Carbon, we'll see, is virtually always going to form four bonds. Here it only has three. Oxygen is virtually always going to form two bonds, and here it has three. Um, so this is a real exception. This notion of how many bonds things tend to form is what we refer to as a concept of valence. <clears throat> These are some typical things that we're going to do in organic here. Oxygen, <clears throat> group six, it's going to have a valence of two. That means it forms two covalent bonds. Now, because it is in group six, that means it has two pairs of unshared electrons. Nitrogen is group five, has a valence of three. It will tend to form three covalent bonds. It has one pair of unshared electrons. Now that's important because virtually all of the chemical reactivity of oxygen and nitrogen are dictated by these unshared pair of electrons. And we'll see that a lot as we go through the course. Boron, unfortunate for boron, is in group three. Has a valence of three, but only has six electrons around it, doesn't it? We'll see in chapter two that this makes boron what's known as a Lewis acid. Very strong Lewis acid and we'll use boron compounds a lot in organic chemistry, taking advantage of the Lewis acidity. And finally, our friend here, carbon. Carbon has a valence of four. It will form four bonds. Now, these can be single, double, or triple bonds, but 99.9% .9 of the compounds will make carbon will have four total bonds. Any questions? All right, let's see where these four bonds come from. We've done this. We know that we have our 1s full, our 2s is full. We have two electrons in the p orbital. Now, if we're going to form four bonds, that means we need four separate electrons, don't we? Just like in the Lewis structure. Well, this is what we start with. But in order to make four bonds, what we have to do is move these S electrons out, fill up the S and all the P's, and come up with um, four potentially bonding electrons. So that's step one. We're dealing with four bonding electrons. Now let's think a little bit about the geometry of carbon compounds. Geometry and spatial things are going to be very, very important in organic. We have one electron here in the 2s orbital. You remember what we said about s orbitals some time ago, is that they are spherical. So they have spherical symmetry. We have three electrons in p orbitals. Now again, these are oriented on the x, y, and z axes. These are 90 degrees to each other, obviously totally different symmetry than we had for the s. So we're going to have to make our four bonds using spherical symmetry combined with these three things. Now, there are essentially three ways you could imagine 
bonding around carbon in terms of its geometry. Today we know exactly what that is because we can do x-ray diffraction. We can literally see the geometry around carbon. But this question as to what the symmetry is, what the geometry is, was actually answered way back in the 1800s by very, very clever people. The three ways that you can imagine, <clears throat> we could take and arrange all of our bonds in a square and call it square plane. We could put one bond up, three down here, call it trigonal pyramidal. Or we could put it with the carbon in the middle and four things around it in tetrahedral geometry. Now, in kindergarten, everybody learns squares and pyramids and stuff like that, but nobody ever learns tetrahedral. I don't know why. It's probably the most important. But in a tetrahedron, the central atom is raised up relative to here. All the bond angles are the same, and all the distances are exactly the same. So it's suspended in the middle between all four things. The question that was asked back in the 18s, something or others, was if you had a carbon compound, let's pretend it's dichloromethane. So one carbon, two hydrogens, two chlorines. If it was square planar, how many different dichloromethanes would there be? Well, we could have the two chlorines opposite each other, or we could have the two chlorines next to each other. Two isomers, two different dichloromethanes. If we had square pyramidal, we could have one chlorine up, one down, or we could have them both down. Once again, two but if carbon was tetrahedral, these two, again, the distances are exactly the same, the angles are exactly the same. This is identical to this, which is identical to this. Basically, there is only one particular way you can arrange the atoms. The fact is that there was only one dichloromethane, and so the logic was carbon must be tetrahedral. Now that's kind of subtle logic for 1870. Today we can explain this two ways. One is using the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, and the other is using hybridization. In valence shell electron pair repulsion, if you recall from general chemistry, what we say is that you try to arrange things around your central atom so that the bonding and non-bonding pairs are as far apart as they can possibly be. So if we had two things around a central atom, the best way the only way to make it work would be to have these two at 180 degrees um, as far apart as they could be. So this is two. Now I hope this little movie plays. Oh, there it goes. So we're at 100. Oops, what happened? <laughs> Hello? Okay, come on. You can do this. Oh my gosh. Well, I have no idea why PowerPoint is doing this to us, but that wasn't very nice, was it? <clears throat> um, let me uh, just interrupt here and play this for you.
I can't play it for you. Ah! All right. Okay, let's go back to this. Well, as we add our third group, it's going to go in and it's going to form trigonal geometry, trigonal and planar. As we add our fourth group, that's when we generate our tetrahedral geometry. Once again, it's the way to put things as far apart as possible. Well, now it's playing. Well, it started to. Oh, now we're at trigonal. I'm not going to do any deep tetrahedral form. Okay. Um, the other way that you can explain the geometry um, based on quantum mechanics is with the concept of hybridization. Now, it's the same basic thing, except hybridization is a solution to an equation. What you're asking is, what is the lowest energy way to arrange all of these electrons? Um, the lowest energy way is to combine these uh, four electrons, hybridize, it's called, and we wind up with a tetrahedral geometry. Same solution that we get from valence pair electron repulsion. Again, all of these are as far apart from each other as they can possibly be. The geometry that we will use to represent most carbon compounds with single bonds is going to be this. <clears throat> Again, these are all equal in length. All the bond angles everywhere are 109.5. Now, quantum mechanics also tells us one other thing. We can solve for what's called a molecular orbital. Molecular orbital answers the question. We have all these electrons in the whole molecule, all of them. Where are they? You do a simple solution um, for this carbon or this compound, one carbon, two hydrogens, and two methane. <clears throat> the molecular lowest energy, highest energy, occupied molecular orbital looks like this, kind of like a lopsided egg sort of thing. Uh, we can cut this away and see the carbon compound in the middle. Again, this is just a region of space where the highest energy electrons would be. Now, molecular orbitals are actually very important in organic chemistry. We're not going to deal too much with them in 234, 235. Um, there's an approach to explaining reactivity, however, that relies upon molecular orbitals. And just so that you have a feel for what it is, uh, when we solve for these regions of space, we can solve for orbitals <clears throat> that are occupied. So these are highest occupied molecular orbitals. This is the one we just saw, the HOMO3. We can also solve for regions of space where the electrons aren't, but they could be. And these are called um, lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals. <coughs> um, again, these have, um, sometimes those are geometries, but these are regions of space in the molecule where you could put electrons. In what's known as frontier molecular orbital theory, making and breaking bonds is done in terms of these molecular orbitals. The reaction that we would look at here is going to involve cyanide. We'll cover this reaction, I think, in chapter 5-ish, maybe 6. But cyanide is going to attack another molecule, and we're going to form something new. Now, this is the highest occupied molecular orbital of cyanide. Size matters here. This means most of the electrons are here, down here by the Cn minus. The reaction we're doing, 
is going to involve cyanide anion attacking bromomethane. Bromine leaves, and we get the compound known as acetonitrile. We'll see examples of this once again in Chapter 6. In Frontier Molecular Orbital Theory, we saw what cyanide looks like, bromomethane, looks like this. This is its lowest unoccupied. So this is where electrons can go. And basically what we're saying is electrons are going to go from the highest occupied to the lowest unoccupied. Process looks like this. Electrons go from here to here. And the halogen bromine now again, we're not going to do this. You would do it in more advanced organic chemistry, um, where you deal physical organic chemistry, where you deal with mechanisms and stuff on a more advanced level. Um, here, we're basically going to stick to this description of the reaction. Any questions? All right, let's finally wind up what can uh, summarize what we know here in terms of bonding, valence, and stuff like that. Carbon, we said, <clears throat> forms four bonds. It is hybridized with 1s and 3p orbitals. We refer to that as an sp3 hybridization. It has tetrahedral geometry, very important. Oxygen here has a valence of two, two unshared pairs, so it's a total of four things around it. Oxygen is uh, also sp3, where two of the positions, like here, are occupied by these paired electrons. Nitrogen, again, four things around it, including the unshared pair. It is also sp3. Boron, because we only have six electrons, must be trigonal. We'll see that we can construct that in something called sp squared. But we'll do that in just a minute. Any questions here on the concepts? Oxygen can form double bonds. We saw a triple bond even. Nitrogen, um, single bonds and double bonds. Carbon. Single, double, and triple. All right, let's use our Lewis approach and let's make ethane. <coughs> ethane is a hydrocarbon with two carbons, six hydrogens. Go ahead and draw the Lewis structure for this compound. Every carbon will have four electrons. Every hydrogen will have one. We start off by putting a carbon and our three hydrogens around it. Now we have two carbons, so we're going to do the same thing over again. And we're looking like this. Remember, we need two electrons to form a covalent bond. So all we have to do is take these guys, scooch them all up. Now if we simply convert our little dots into our covalent bond lines, ethane would look like this. Remember, each of the carbons is going to be tetrahedral. Because they're each tetrahedral, this is what it would look like in a molecular model. Carbon in the middle. Three hydrogens around each one, a total of four bonds for every carbon, one, two, three, four. Any question? All 
All right. Let's look at a different carbon compound. Instead of ethane, this is going to be called ethene. Ethene has two carbons but only four hydrogens. Go ahead and draw the Lewis structure for ethene. Once again, each carbon is simply going to have four electrons around it. Each hydrogen has one. So we can assemble the thing. There's one, or four electrons, two hydrogens. And we do it again. Now remember, we need to give each carbon four bonds and eight valence electrons. If we simply scooch these together, we can form single bonds here, 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 here. And we have two electrons here on the outside that we have to pair up. We're going to move these in between the two carbons so they look like that. Now we have two, four, six, eight electrons around each carbon, two electrons around each hydrogen. If we draw this with our line bonds, it would look like that. These carbons have three groups around them, even though this is a double bond. So this is trigonal geometry. This is what ethene looks like. Here's our carbon-carbon double bond. Once again, this is planar and trigonal. Now what I'd like to do is to discuss the hybridization that allows this to form. We know if we're going to form three bonds, we need three orbitals. So we'll start off with what's known as our sigma network. These are the covalent bonds holding the atoms together. We have three covalent bonds holding them together. Therefore, we need three orbitals. One S, and we're going to use two of the P's. When we do this, we form a trigonal network, 123 bond angles, and planar. Any questions? Well, the question should be, gee, what happened to the fourth p orbital, or the third p orbital, our fourth orbital? Well, it's still there, and it still has electrons, doesn't it? Each carbon must have one of these leftover orbitals. So if we take and we put them on each carbon, we would make this. Our sigma network, again, is what holds the actual atoms together, sigma bonds, covalent bonds. These are at right angles to our plane here, again going up and down, up and down. Now when orbitals are sitting next to each other like this, they can interact with each other. This is called overlap. If these orbitals overlap, that means that the electrons here in these P's can be shared in this cloud. Again, the cloud is above and below the plane here of our carbons. We can, it looks like a hot dog. We can cut the hot dog bun open and see the thing inside. This, um, area of electrons above and below the plane is referred to as a pi bond. Pi because it comes from p orbitals. <clears throat> this is called a pi cloud. Electrons are in this pi cloud, once again, above and below the plane 
of our carbon atoms. When we draw a carbon-carbon double bond, what we're supposed to remember is that one of these bonds is real. It's our sigma bond. That's our true covalent bond. The second bond we draw is this pi bond. Pi bond is formed from overlap of these p orbitals. Now we can see what ethene actually looks like, sort of, using what's known as an electrostatic potential map. Now a lot of people will describe electrostatic potential maps as being electron density. And you know, even though that's not quite right, that's a good way to think about it. Actually, it's not. Um, the way you calculate this is to figure out a surface, and <clears throat> then you move a point charge up to the surface, and you see how the electrons rearrange themselves in response to the point charge. Nonetheless, it's close as far as electron density goes. <clears throat> Red always means lots and lots of electrons. Blue is electron deficient. Here we'll see the region of our pi cloud as this thing. You'll see it's a big, squishy collection of electrons above and below our plane. This is important to you because when we do reactions of alkenes, that's carbon carbon double bonds, virtually all the reactions are going to involve this pi cloud. Now, there's one other thing about this pi bond that's of interest. We were able to form this pi system because these orbitals overlap. Whenever you have a sigma bond, a simple covalent bond, you can have rotation around it, free rotation. It's very rapid. However, if we had rotation around this carbon-carbon bond, this guy, we would move these orbitals um, at 90 degrees to each other, orthogonal. And the overlap integral, it's called, drops to zero. That means when we get here, there is no overlap. We destroy our pi bond. Because of that, rotation around a carbon-carbon double bond is very, very difficult. That means something very interesting we'll cover in chapter 5 that we can have what are called stereoisomers. If we have a carbon-carbon double bond, because we cannot rotate around it, this compound is different than this one. Even though they both have four carbons, and they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hydrogens. Here, these two are on opposite sides of our double bond. We'll call that trans. And here they're on the same side, they're called cis. We'll refer to these as stereoisomers, same numbers and types of atoms, simply arranged differently in space. Chapter 5. All right, one other way we can arrange the orbitals on carbon. This is going to be called an sp hybrid. Here we're going to take one s and one p, and we're going to make two bonds. Again, two things, linear geometry. Now, we still have p orbitals left over, don't we? Two of them on each carbon. So if we put our two p orbitals on each carbon, they would look like this. Just like we did with a carbon-carbon double bond, these guys are going to overlap, these are going to overlap, and we can form orbitals, combined orbitals, that look like this. Again, imagine two hot dog buns 
side by side with this thing in the middle. We start off with our single bond here from our sigma network. Each of these pi bonds contributes um, to one bond. Again, we are meant to understand two of these are pi bonds and one is simply a sigma. This is the carbon-carbon triple bond. Um, if we looked at this in terms of electrostatic potential map, it would look like this. Again, it has this huge belt of electrons due to a pi system. We'll refer to these triple bond compounds as alkynes, and virtually all the reactions of alkynes are going to be centered on this belt of electron density. So, to summarize, for carbon we have three ways we can hybridize. We can form single bonds, that's SP cubed hybridization, or equivalent bonds, tetrahedral geometry. <clears throat> A double bond, no rotation, SP squared hybridization. And a triple bond, SP hybridization, linear geometry, two pi bonds, one sigma. In chapter two, we will address this in terms of functional groups. Functional groups are important and interesting because it allows organic chemistry to be very, very simple. That is, all members of a given functional group will have very similar types of reactions. And organic is all about reactions. If we have only single bonds, we'll call this an alkane. All carbons are sp cubed, they're all tetrahedral. All alkanes will have n number of hydrogens and two n plus or carbons and two n plus two hydrogens all alkanes. An alkene will have a carbon-carbon double bond. It has at least one sp squared carbon, again um, trigonal geometry, and alkynes, linear geometry, two pi bonds, one sigma. Um, this is called an alkyne. All right. Any questions here on the concepts? Let's just do a couple quick problems. This is an organic molecule. It has a little yellow line in it. And these questions refer to this compound. Number one, in this entire compound, indicate the carbon that has sp cubed hybridization. Now, remember SP cubed. We must have only single bonds. It will have tetrahedral geometry. All of these guys are double bonds, aren't they? Only carbon that is truly SP cubed is this guy here. All right, the carbon-carbon-carbon bond angle that's highlighted here would have what value? Look at our three carbons. This one we just said is sp cubed, right? This is a carbon carbon double bond. What's the geometry there? That's sp squared, and it's trigonal, isn't it? When we have trigonal, our bond angle right here is 120 degrees. How do we know that? Is that the same for all trigonal 
all, all three of the things are 120. <clears throat> Again, that's the way you can arrange the bonding pairs or non bonding pairs so they're as far apart as possible. All right, we have two oxygens in our compound here. Which one of these is going to have sp squared hybridization? When we have a carbon that was only single bonds, we said that was sp fused, right? When we had a carbon that had a double bond, we said that was sp squared. This oxygen here, we don't show it, but it has two pairs of electrons on it, doesn't it? Four things around it, two bonds. This guy up here, however, is in a carbon oxygen double bond. It's a double bond, therefore it's sp squared. <clears throat> this functional group is called a carbonyl, carbon oxygen double bond. Carbonyl chemistry really gets very important in 235. Um, <clears throat> carbonyl compounds undergo reaction at the carbon. It's a relatively positive center and um, again, this is the highlight of 235. Another bond angle here, CCO. So we're looking at this bond angle like that. What would that be? 120. Again, this is an SP squared system, isn't it? It must be trigonal at 120. And finally, how many sp squared atoms do we have in this compound? Seven. Well, these are all double bonds, aren't they? We'll see that this is called a benzene ring later on. And the oxygen makes eight. I wasn't sure if that's SP2. It is SP2. Yeah. No, remember we have two electrons on there, yeah. two pairs, and those are in the trigonal geometry associated with that. All right, how many sp hybridized atoms do we have in this guy? Sp, we recall, is our triple bond with linear geometry, right? So here we have a carbon-carbon triple bond. So that's simple, that's two of them. Here we have a carbon-nitrogen triple bond. All four of these are SP. Nitrogen, remember, has a lone pair of electrons sticking out this way. <clears throat> Look at this. How many sp cubed hybridized atoms do we have here? This is a ring of carbons, isn't it? There are six of them. We will call this a six-membered ring. You'll note the particular geometry here. And we will actually refer to this as a chair conformation. Looks like a lounge chair, if you think about it. You know, 
sit down there on that one. <clears throat> this is a stable conformation because as it is drawn, every carbon here is allowed to have perfect tetrahedral geometry. So all of these must be sp squared, sp cubed. So is this guy. How about our nitrogen? Three bonds and a lone pair of electrons that we haven't shown. There are eight sp cubed atoms. And finally, look at this molecule and simply put in all of the unshared pairs of electrons. Carbon is going to virtually never have an unshared pair of electrons if it's neutral. So forget about the carbons. Oxygen, we said, <coughs> group six, valence of two, and two unshared pairs. Here we have two bonds, we have two unshared pairs, like hydrogen, three bonds, and one unshared pair. There's our oxygen, there's our oxygen, and here's our nitrogen. Once again, the chemistry, the organic chemistry of oxygen and nitrogen virtually depends totally on this unshared pair of electrons. Very important to make sure you remember these. Any questions? But it's secret. Don't tell anybody. All right, let's finish up with a discussion of the representation of carbon compounds. We're going to be dealing with carbon compounds. We have to figure out how to draw these things so that we all know what we're talking about. Carbon compounds can be very, very complex. They can be simple chains like we've shown here with a branch coming out. Um, here's our six-membered carbon ring. These are all in ball stick um, molecular models. This is actually bicyclic. If you could trace this through and see it, you see there's one ring going this way and then another ring going up. Carbon compounds can be very, very complex. You can also take and stick in what are called heteroatoms. Organic chemists, again, focus on carbon. Anything that isn't carbon is something else. And we use hetero for something else. Um, oxygen is typically shown as red. This is glucose, the sugar. Um, this is morphine. Nitrogen is blue. You see morphine is a fairly complex structure. Carbon-carbon double bonds, single bonds. This is oxygen bonded to two carbons couple of H groups, etc. Very, very complex structures are possible in organic chemistry. Now, as we go to represent these things, we will use molecular models, and we will use simple representations. They all have their different advantages. This ball and stick, this is what we've used um, a lot so far. For this particular compound, you can see we have four carbons connected together. We have three hydrogens here, three here, and two on these two. We could also represent this in what's called a stick model or driving model. Driving was the guy that um, actually made the molecular model kit that you can see put together. Um, looks a lot like this. Again, the same four carbons. We just have sticks instead of balls. 
Space milling. These are all three on the same scale. The advantage of space milling is you can see really what this guy looks like. So the electrons in this pretty much um, fill this space here. Um, the disadvantage is, as we'll see, quite often it's impossible to see um, really what's on the inside of a space milling model. <clears throat> we can also take and represent a simple carbon compound just by its molecular formula. So this one has four carbons, ten hydrogens, C4H10. Nice and compact, but it tells you nothing about the structure. We can draw what's called a condensed structure. In a condensed structure, we take the molecule and convert it into individual pieces, write them together, um, set of rules for this, we'll do that. <clears throat> for this compound, we have a CH3 on the end, then we have two CH2s, and a CH3 on this end. This is a condensed structure. We can also take and represent this in what's called a Kekulé structure. Kekulé is a very famous organic chemist. We'll get to him later. But this shows all the bonds to all the atoms nice and clearly um, as you would in a Lewis structure. Um, the problem with this is that this is just a real pain in the butt. Lots of lines, lots of carbons, lots of hydrogens. So organic chemists tend to instead use what are known as line drawings. This is what we'll use mostly. A line drawing. Whenever you have a line coming out that's truncated, that tells you it's a CH3. This is our CH3. Anytime you have a simple vertex, that's this guy and this guy, that is a CH2. Sure makes drawing the structure a whole lot easier than putting in all the carbons and hydrogens. We draw this as a zigzag. Why? Well, look at our molecular model. For tetrahedral geometry, it sure looks a whole lot like our simple zigzag, doesn't it? So this tends to relay the spatial information as well as the numbers and types of carbons. Now, of course, nothing is simple. If we convert this calculate into a line drawing, that would be the simple line drawing. Quite often, however, in textbooks, on the internet, and whatever. People are trying to be nice to you. And so instead of just leaving it this way, they'll embellish this a little bit and maybe stick the CH3s on the end. That helps you remember that the truncated line is in fact a CH3. Some people, however, look at this and say, well, this one's OK, but this is stupid looking. Because it looks like this carbon is bonded to the hydrogen. Therefore, they'll reverse it and draw it this way. I assure you, you will see them written all ways, all possible combinations. Just make sure you're able to look at them, interpret them for exactly what they are. Any question? Let's just take one of our stick drawings here and look at one more way to project it. Again, this is our line drawing embellished to show our CH3 groups. If I take this structure, remember each of these are CH2s, aren't they? Right now I'm looking at it on its side. If I take it and I tipped it a bit, I could draw this. This is 
this carbon, this is this carbon. This is called a sawhorse conjecture. Gets its name because I guess you can imagine it as a sawhorse if you rotate. Remember, you can rotate around these things. <coughs> So this is a sawhorse projection. Why would you do this? Because we will see that in lots of instances, the arrangement of the carbon atoms and the hydrogens and whatever in the molecule are important in reactivity. This allows you to look at this bond and look at the orientation of all these groups more clearly. Taking us to its limit, we can do what's called a Newman projection. In a Newman, we rotate this all the way, so this is our front atom here in front. And just to make sure we know who's in front and who's in back, we make the back atom, that's this guy, into a big ball. So here's our back atom, two hydrogens and a CH3, front atom, two hydrogens and a CH3. Again, we'll see that Newman's also have very important use in terms of looking at carbon compounds. And we're not having much luck with movies today, but this is supposedly a movie. This is a little um, stick model, a driving model. Hopefully it'll run. Maybe not. <laughs> oh my goodness. I have no idea why PowerPoint won't do this for me today. But OK. <clears throat> if you want, we can look at them later. Um, if you want to look at those particular movies. Let's do a couple problems here. Let's take these various drawings and convert them into line drawings. Now I will give you a hint as to what's coming in the future. Um, on Blackboard, one of the links that you'll see is called the Drawing Palette. It's a uh, very elegant little JavaScript thingy that allows you to draw line drawings for various compounds. It will then convert it into a code that's called a SMILES string. SMILES is an acronym for something. It's about been smiley, but nonetheless, um, what you will use this drawing palette for are quizzes and things like that. You will have a problem, let's say on Blackboard, with a compound written like this. You are expected to then open the drawing palette, draw the structure, copy the smile string, paste it back into Blackboard, and you'll be graded on whether you're right or not. Isn't that exciting? All right. For our first one here, this is a condensed structure. This means we have a CH3 on the end. We have a carbon that's bonded to two CH3s, so they're both attached here. Then we have a CH2, a CH2, and another CH3. Step one, you want to identify your chain. How many carbons are there in your chain? One, two, three, four, five. Step two, you draw your zigzag. One, two, three, four. Five. Now, on our second carbon here, we have two CH3s. We show those as truncated lines looking like that.
everyone see that? Step one, and your longest chain, five carbons. A second carbon in, we have two CH3s and two lines attached here. Now isn't that fun? That is fun. Next, let's take our six-membered ring here and represent that as a line drawing. Remember, every vertex is going to be a CH3. So we have nothing but CH2s in this, don't we? Simplest way is to just look at this and say, okay, well this goes down, up, down, up, down, and up, right? And they're all CH2s. So we could just do this. Now you see how this looks more like a lounge chair. That's our chair confirmation. We'll do that in a couple of chapters. Can it do like a ring? Hmm? Can it do like a ring? You can do a ring. Yes, you can. Um, when we do conformational analysis, however, you will draw them like this. And so you must get very, very, very good at drawing them like that. All right, our next guy is a Newman. We're going to do this the same way, however. Let's look at our Newman and let's find our longest chain. <clears throat> we would have one, two, three, that's our front carbon, one, two, three, our back carbon is four, and then we have five and six. That's our longest chain. One, two, three, back carbon, four, five, six. So we draw a six carbon zigzag. Again, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, <clears throat> on our third carbon in, so one, two, three, we have a CH3, don't we? Third carbon in, we need a CH3. On our fourth carbon in, we also have another CH3 dangling down, so we need another one here. And that is our line drawing. Now there's one other way to take a Newman and take it apart. That's a little easier for beginners anyway. And let's just look at this. Here's our new one. What I want to do is look at this as a sawhorse. Okay? As a sawhorse. Remember, this is going to be our front carbon. And the big ball is our back. Our sawhorse we want to draw on a little bit of an angle, don't we? On our front carbon, we're going to have a two carbon chain going up, our CH3. Our back carbon, we'll have a two carbon chain going this way, and another CH3. Two carbon chain going up, two carbon chain going that way. This is the two carbons, the front and the back. Now it's easy to convert, isn't it? Now it's easy to see. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, with a CH3 here on the third carbon and another one on the fourth. Here's a red chain corresponding to that. And in case you forgot your red pen,
Any questions? All right, let me just <clears throat> answer a question before you even have a chance to ask it. What if you had drawn this differently? What if instead of having this fancy zigzag, you had this going up or down, or you flipped it over, or you turned it sideways, or stood it on its nose? Would that be right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we have free rotation around all of these bonds. Ah, this one worked. This is an animation of a five carbon chain just sitting there and doing its thing quietly. It didn't loop though, it was supposed to loop. As you can see, this can adopt virtually any possible conformation. All of these transitions happen roughly 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 times per second. So these things are spinning madly. In this molecule, we would have free rotation around all of these bonds that I've shown. This and this are exactly the same structure. <coughs> because these things happen 10 to the 6 times per second, these are indistinguishable. We will call these conformational isomers. Isomer, same numbers and types of atoms, just different spatial arrangements. But because they're interchanging so fast, we regard these as the same compound. So it doesn't matter how you draw them. In fact, that's one of the amazing things about the drawing palette and the smile string. You can draw this thing any way you want it, and you still get the same structure. So again, that's what's coming probably as soon as next week. Remember, a double bond, you can't rotate around it. Triple bond, how would you know? Because it's linear. So, uh, actually, if you did rotate, um, but you wouldn't want to. But you don't want to go there yet. But double bonds, no. Although, let me digress for a second. As you're all looking at this, we're all using vision, aren't we? You know how vision really works? Well, there's a, a molecule called retinol. <clears throat> Lots of carbons in it, and it has a double bond. The double bond will originally have cis geometry, cis stereochemistry, so they're both on the same side. When that molecule absorbs a photon of light, it swings around to the trans. And your brain says, oops, I just saw a photon. And that's how vision works. Cis-trans isomerization. All right, let's wind this all up. Just with an exercise where we're going to take structures and draw fine lines. Our first one, we have a carbon in the middle. We have four things attached to it, and one of them is a bromine. <clears throat> in a line drawing, these are all going to be truncated, aren't they? So we have to show that this guy is a bromine. That would work. Now, could you draw it just as a simple cross? Sure. Could you put the 
bromine down here somewhere? Sure. All the same compound. Our next one. <clears throat> step one, you identify the longest chain, don't you? Always your first step. One, two, three, four, five carbons. On our second carbon, we have a CH3. Could you draw this backwards, upside down? Could you take it and turn one of them up and down or sideways? Absolutely. Longest your longest chain is five carbons with a CH3 on the second carbon. What's our longest chain here? <clears throat> One, two, three, four. Right? And on this carbon, we have two CH3 groups. Once again, you can flip it upside down, sideways, stand it on its head. It's all the same. Any questions? Two more. Our longest chain here is going to be one, two, three, four, five carbons. We will have two carbon-carbon double bonds. We will have a CH3 and a bromine attached. We can draw it like that. Now I flip this over just to be that way, but I can do that, can't I? One, two, three, four, five carbons, two double bonds, one in the first, one in the second here, and our bromine attached at the first double bond. Our next one, what's our longest chain here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Are there any side chains? No. I just kind of drew it stupid. Simple. Seven carbon, zigzag. a sawhorse. Our longest chain. <clears throat> Start here with our front carbon. One, two, three, four, five. Right? And on our one, two, third carbon end, we have a CH3. Five carbon zigzag, CH3 on our third carbon. It looks like that. Six SP cubed carbons in a ring. Now we know we did this a little bit. Of a little bit ago, we drew it in a chair conformation, didn't we? To follow up on your question, you can also just draw a perfect hexagon. Works fine, conveys the same information. And our 
last one for today. How many carbons in a ring? It's a stop sign. Draw a stop sign. And we have double bond. Double bond, double bond, double bond, four double bonds in our stop sign. And it looks like Now, just like we said, our six-membered ring had unique geometry, so does this. And when we do more about conformational analysis, we'll see that this really isn't flat, but it's actually in a basket style or bucket style. Any questions? I assure you, by the time we get through just a little bit of organic chemistry, the transitions here back and forth are going to be as easy as breathing. Okay? If you think you have any problems um, understanding this, you know, maybe open up the drawing palette on Blackboard. Just practice drawing some structures. It's fun. Um, you can also go to the Organic Chemistry Online Partition, look at problems, etc., and work in that way. The book, um, there are also problems in the back doing these same types of conversions. Any questions? All right, well, that's chapter one. Again, a whole lot of it was review of general chemistry, <clears throat> getting into how do we draw carbon compounds. Chapter two is going to be Thursday, and we also get to watch the lab safety movie, which is exciting. Um, if you've been here at Triton before and taken chemistry, it's yes, it 